Here we are having a conversation with Mr. George Raymond, famous Jamaican recording engineer from Jamaica. Yeah. A lot of the veterans, Toots and the Natives, Bob, Peter, Oswald, Steel Pulse, Burning Spear. And it goes on and on, Slim Smith, Pat Kelly, Trim Boot, Lloyd Charmer, a very good friend of mine, taught me a lot about production back in the day. The chariot, the carriers, and so on. I came to Kingston in 1962 and went to school, school called St. George's College down in North Street. And after school, I would go down Harry Street and check out the various spots like Bonnelie, uh, Prince uh, Boston. Never got home until 10 o'clock. Trying to find out the roots of reggae. Yeah. I was affiliated with um, Tomas Jadian, worked at Federal Records for many years. But there was a hunger for me to find out the pulse of the music. So I started to venture down places like Trench Town and things like that, talking with different people. I lost a lot of friends along the way. But, uh, what am I doing down in Trench Town? In a place called Fish Street, where Bob lived. You know, Bob came from St. He was a welder. And uh, after doing a lot of welding, a spark flew in his eye, and he decided to, to uh, shout that and the music. Uh, he met um, Chris Blackwell, a rich Englishman who loved reggae. And Chris Blackwell said, uh, Give you 5,000 British pounds if you can make an album. So he went up in the hills and wrote 20 songs, and out of that came Catch a Fire. That was the conception. So I was one of the engineers that was involved with it. Me, Sylvia and Morris, and I don't remember the other one, it was a third engineer. And each one of us did three, four tracks. And then tapes went to London. <laughs> it was a fiasco, you know what I mean? Everything was so mixed up and it turned it into rock and all sort of stuff. And when he came back, from jump from London and put it on the machine and it was a mess. Everything bleeding into everything and there was no separation or nothing. But that album was a conceptual album catch up by Go Over Jail is still it up. And most of the songs that Johnny Nash did on his album called I Can See Clearly Now. Yeah. And then after that now I started to work with him. Yeah. With one of his engineers. There was one then the stamps was one, and then you know, you know. And um, I did five albums with him. I did Uprising, Natty Dread, Exodus, Survival, and Kaya. I did his first song in Strange Town, right? Tucky Conqueror, and I broke yourself, Small Axe, and Natty Dread. Those five singles. At Scratch, Mr. Lee Perry. Yeah. So the band was an a cappella group. The backup band was a band called the Hippie Boys, which was Glide Charmer's band. Most people didn't realize he was a genius, played keyboards, percussions, and stuff. And then they got the idea, and the wheelers were formed. You know, it was all come from the original was Bunny, Peter, Bob, and another man that got blown into the wind was a guy named. Mr. Joe Higgs. It just blossomed from there. And Peter was the radical, and Peter thought about a lot of stuff. You know? I was, I was with Bob for four years, and it was a split, and 
Slyon Rally left and went to taxi. And then I was with 44 Road with so Syndicate and you know. I was involved with the first song with Peter called Marga Dog. And uh, that's how I got inducted into the Peter Tash regime. You know? So the first time we met officially was at Patrick Watt's place when I was doing the album for him. Major of Aquinas, remember that? Right. And you were telling me a little more this, a little more that? Yes. Right? And I said, well, as I change the EQ, uh, I don't leave it in the mix, but just change the EQ a little, remember? Yeah. Did it work? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I was affiliated with Tim Rush, you know, to this company called West Indies Records, which was for Byron Lee and, and Ken Poole. And after that, they had a split, and I stayed with Federal Records, and Byron Lee went around the other side of the Bell Road. I was an uh, understudy. My mentor was a guy called Louis Davidson, we nicknamed him Buddy. And uh, he taught me you know, studio procedures and uh, maintenance and stuff like that. And uh, I just became a sponge. And all I did was just putting tapes on the machine, taught me a lot about techniques. My thing, and I, you know, I developed my micing techniques to a certain extent. I worked a lot with the scatterlights you know, back in the day, and uh, experimenting with different mics and, and uh, session and pre mixing. In those days, it was two track. Everything was done live. The drums and the bass mixed together with other, they had limited tracks. So I taught me to develop my ears and how to, to do mixing and stuff like that. You know, and then eventually now, it came to the eight track, four track, you had more facilities, 16 tracks, you had more facilities, you could spread it out and, you know. But there was no such thing as catch it in the mix. It has to be done right. If there's a problem, you have to solve it. Because if you don't solve it, it's going to come right to the consumer, which is you buying the record. The first session that I went solo on was a, a, a session by Father Richard Holland, Sinner, You've Gone to Hell. That was a four track, that was an um, eight track session. And I came in the morning and I sat up, set up the studio, as I usually do, patch up the board. And there it was, in those days, everything was patching and things. And then I telephoned the office and I said, buddy, I'm ready for you. The studio is set up, we are ready to go. He says, you are going solo today. Man, my hands got wet. You know, I was a bag of nerves. I was afraid to press the red button. You know, I was making sure everything was done right and the musicians were getting antsy. Well, we're ready, we're ready. So I said, here goes nothing. Boom. And everything came out okay. So that was my first session going solo. After that I settled down and then I saw less and less of body and I became chief engineer of Federal Records. That was it. And where was Federal Records located? Bell Road of um, Hagley Park Road in Kingston. We were at the, at the um, beginning of Bell Road and and the Dragon Age was it at the back of the road. And then I became involved in the studio part of it. Then I met a good friend of mine who is very well known in the industry. My name is Wolfgang Federlin, who was the cutting engineer. A brilliant guy from Germany. And he became the cutting engineer. And then I was with Buddy. And then eventually now, Wolfgang now became huge. He has Wolf Sound, which is a big sound interesting company. You know, so it started with everybody as a family and everybody went to separate ways.
Well, um, I was born in Montego Bay, 13th of September 1947. I went to Cornwall College. My father worked with customs, then he became a clerk of the courts. Then uh, my mom was from uh, Palestinian Italian extraction. And uh, he got transferred to Kingston in 1962. That's when the whole family went to Kingston in 1962. Then that's how my musical career started. I went to St. George's after school. At 2 o'clock, I would go down town to places like Prince Buster, Tony Lee, you know, Juke uh, Reed, you know, all these places. Tubbies was becoming a human sponge, listening to the pulse. You see, in Jamaica, you had what you call uptown reggae and downtown reggae, you know, sweet reggae, the Ernest Smith and the Kenya. Then they had the roots, the downtown guys, you know, the sound system, this and this. And. So I was curious. Never got home until 10, 11 o'clock. Everybody wants to know where George is. On the weekends, I disappear, just get into the music. You must move around and get my ears tuned. So people say, well, you don't look like a Rasta man. Well, how can you do reggae? Well, I was born into the culture and I just became a huge humongous fun and I learned the relationship between the bass and drum and how to, you know, how to do reggae. But in Jamaica, we had a musician who did rock and roll, jazz, you know, a lot of songs that we took from other music and turned it into reggae. Because we were very famous for that. You know, a lot of these artists like Slim Smith, Pat Kelly, and took a lot of tunes from the foreign and turned them into reggae. You know, some were original, like Larry Chama did a lot of original. Derek Harrod did a lot of cover songs. Ken Booth did a famous one, Bread, Everything I Own. Um, Lorna Bennett, Breakfast in Bed. A lot of people thought it was her original. It was done by Shirley Bassey original. So we were famous. You know, we could play the rock and roll and stuff, and then we could play the reggae. And that's how it developed. Yeah. And you also did a lot of work with um, the Soul Syndicate band. Oh, yes, yes. I was with Soul Syndicate for many years with Fully Fullwood, uh, Keith Sterling, uh, Santa. I was, their, I was their engineer for many, many years. You know? And um, as I said, when I um, did Mother Dog, it, I was at, um, I think Joe Gibbs or Cox and I, in those days we would do a lot of readings in different keys. And here came in Peter, you know, with his walking stick and he knew call me Mr. Engineer and Bob called me Georgie. He said, Mr. Engineer, what you doing? I said, well, we'll take a break. He said, well, you know, what you have on the machine, I can hear it and we'll run the rhythm. I run the rhythm for him and took out a brown paper bag with a pencil and I see him write some lyrics down. And then he said, I'm going in and said, open the mic and run it down one time. And the next time, press the button. Press the red button, the record. And the next time, when the light came on and started to, it was Marga Dog. One tape, mixed and everything straight to the cutting room. So he knew me from that conception of Marga Dog. So as I said, when Sly and Robbie left and found Taxi, he invited Santa and Fully to come and join him. So I asked Fully to put in a word for me, and that's how I got to the people. And you, it, huh? you worked with a lot of a, a, a lot of foreign artists also, correct? Yeah, I did. Um, Eric Clapton's I Shot the Show. I did Paul Simon's Modern Child Arena. I did Johnny Nash, Pull Me Tight. And then um, I Can See Clearly Now. 
tears on my pillow and uh, you know, celebrate life. And that exposed me to missing those with federal with the agents from many labels. And that's how I got the final exposure. And then when I work with um, Eric Clapton with I Shot the Sheriff, then I did, a, I did a lot of work with a band that you have called Queen. And I work with um, Led Zeppelin, the Moody Blues, Pink Floyd. I, I, well, right now I do jazz, reggae, rock and roll, gospel and funk. And this was all in Jamaica at that time? Basically, basically, basically. But I didn't get into gospel until I came across the waters. I was just doing rock and roll, jazz and reggae. And I, would, and I was house engineer at Federal Records. I see from the front. Federal Records closed down. Everybody went separate ways. But I was always coming to America but not living. You know? but then, finally, my group came on to live. And then, I went to California, got hooked up with a friend of mine called George O'Connor, who took me down to a market called Stone's Market, where I met a lot of musicians. And I found out where I was, and I started to work with a lot of the local bands. And in those days, I was the only engineer on the West Coast that understood reggae. <coughs> So I started to work with a band called Jamaica Incorporated. And then I was discovered, I was doing some shows at a <coughs> club in the city that called Country Club. And I got hooked up with Roger Steffen. I'm Roger Steffens. And I'm Chuck Foster. And our subject today is the work of the extraordinary engineer, George Raymond. George Raymond started in 1961, and that was prior to Jamaica independence, prior really to the birth of ska music. And what can you say about those early days of Jamaican music, Jeff? Well, a lot of people think of early Jamaican music as being either mento or being that Jamaican rhythm and blues that you heard coming out of the Treasure Isle and Studio One, but it's very interesting when you listen to the work that George Raymond was doing at Federal because it's, it's a more sophisticated style of music. It, it, a lot of the music on this recent release that came out of the Japanese dub store, this Jamaica Jazz from Federal Records, and it's covering 1960 to 1968, and it's almost lounge music. There's some definitely hotel band type stuff, but there's some just great jazz playing by Ernest Wranglin and, and, and just the quality level of the musicians and of the recording. Uh, it's just amazing because a lot of people think of early Jamaican music as being crude, but this music is extremely sophisticated and extremely well recorded. A lot of that is due to the tourist influence because the bands that played in those days had to be incredibly flexible and be able to play polkas and uh, Italian music and French music and uh, Caribbean uh, rhythms from Cuba and Haiti. Uh, they were very versatile musicians and uh, the early days of ska finds George Raymond playing bass in 1963 and 1964. And uh, let me throw some songs out at you uh, that he worked on. Um, Delroy Wilson made a really wonderful album called Sarge. And one of the key tracks is a Whalers cover called I'm Still Waiting. Great, great version. You know, Delroy Wilson, such a great singer from the early, early days. I only had the chance to see him live a couple of times, and I think George Raymond was doing the sound at Consolidated Realty Plaza the first time I saw Delroy Wilson. Uh, great, great show, great singer. Bob Andy, uh, not just a great uh, singer, but a great composer. Fire Burning, produced by Lloyd Charmers, engineered by George Raymond. And, and uh, what a songwriter, and what a great singer, you know. I, 
had read the story about Coxone uh, calling the different singers together and, and giving Ken Booth this rhythm and Delroy Wilson that rhythm and this rhythm to that person that Jackie Matu had structured because they were those were the keys that fit their voice and I said something about this to Bob Andy and he said to me I can sing in any key. <laughs> so so when when was that the first time you meet um, Sam Williams? Well I was with a friend of mine driving going to the mall and the phone ring mm -hmm. can I speak to Mr. George Raymond I said speak to him this is Patrick Ross you know and Maskell told me to find you I'd like you to do some mixing for me. And that was the album, Age of Aquarius. Okay. That was the first time I met this man officially. That was a big hit in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. Well, well. <laughs> <laughs> we hit everywhere. Age of Aquarius by the fifth dimension. No? Mm -hmm. What we call the album, Age well, of Aquarius. The actual name of the album is Age of Aquarius, Love Yourself. That's right. That's the mm -hmm. missing part. So, Mr. Ricky Williams came over to the house to scrutinize what was happening. Yeah. But his ears is a little too sharp. Started to work with a band called Jamaica Incorporated. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, Jamaica Incorporated were opening up for a group at the country club one day. And, um, Roger Steffens was in the crowd, Patrick Burrow from Berlin was in the crowd, and we were opening up for, of all people, Toots and the Maytels. Then when they heard Jamaica Incorporated, this bass and drum and the yard, the sound, and everybody got curious, wondering who was doing it. Then Roger Steffens gave me some interviews, Babylon Warriors wanting me to work with them. I got hooked up with Toots right there, because Toots wasn't traveling with an engineer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then the local bands I worked with was with Mr. Maskell, the Rastafarians, Babylon Warriors, and a band called Native, William Jackson. Native. They were the big bands I worked with in California. Then I met um, this guy had a place on Crenshaw called Kingston Joe, by Rob Bryan, on Crenshaw. And then I got hooked up with him. Then I started doing his little song for him, then he moved up from there to in Santa Monica. Then I became house engineer for um, Kingston Trail. And Kingston Trail was part of the regular circuit. You know, and I was house engineer for Kingston Trail for quite a few years. And then I got hooked up with this company called Tone Right, which was owned by a guy named Steel Shine, that did figures and stuff for the Steel Platinum. And I was with him for five years. So I was there at Kingston Trail, and a lot of people knew where to find me. I was in a little sound booth. Um, Jamaica Incorporated was there and they were open for many groups and then it, as I said it was part of the, the touring circuit and um, fully came in with syndicate and the rest is history my friend, you know, you know? And, um, Jamaica Incorporated got a lot of opportunities but didn't capitalize on it. So I don't know where all of them is now. Oh. And what studios did you work out of? I um, freelanced out of Kid City West. That was, that was where I freelanced out of. I did a lot of work here with uh, Shaka Man. I did a lot of work with a band called Macaw, which was Johnny Nash's uh, percussion player. Freelance out of Westlake Audio, uh, Present Time, and Vine Gun, uh, Music Lab. So I've been around California studios, but my main hub was at Big City West.
which was owned by a, a fellow named Jason Berry. Very nice guy. Yeah. And I was with him for years. Until I am. Uh, I don't think all these places exist anymore. I worked at the Roxy. Music Machine. Troubadour. Country Club. Kingston 12, which where I was the um, sound man for them for many years. California has changed a lot, so I've heard. And, uh, you know, I was um, associated with Holy Food for many years, and he still lives in um, San Clemente, you know, Tony Chin in San Clemente. Um, a lot of my friends are there, but the whole complexion of California has changed. I did Bob Marley Day every year, you know, up, went up from um, LA all the way up to San Francisco, played um, There was a big festival called Reggae by the River, like an Indian Has a lot of memories to me, but I've heard it's, it's not the same. But that's my home state and I miss it sometimes, you know. So we go. Life is cycles and cycles. That's my thing. So I work with everybody. Johnny Nash, Eric Clapton, um, Abba, Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, the Moody Blues. Um, when I was with Peter, um, the Rolling Stones, Wooden Powers. I did a lot of stuff with Maskell at Paramount, which bring back a lot of memories. Um, You're talking about Haile Maskell? Yes, the, the founder of the Brasso Fire. bring back a lot of memories to me. And we were talking the other day and he said, you know, by the way, you are on some of my early recordings at Federal. And he brought back certain things and it, it touched bases with me. And he said, Bob was in that session. Um, my guy, Russ Michael. That was a long time ago. Ages and ages ago. But I was very fortunate to enter the business when I was 15. And a lot of these people that I've worked with has left this earth and got in the sky. Jackie McKee, Winston Wright. You know, Slim Smith, Pat Kelly, Eli Chalmers, who was a fantastic person. He was a genius in my opinion. The guy could do seven part harmony. Fantastic guy. He taught me a lot about production. And I have pleasant memories from him. Mr. Derek Harriet, the chariot is still alive. You know, King Toby is dead, scratches in Paris, looking like a peacock with all these red ears and stuff. You know. Tony Garnett, I don't know if you're familiar with Tony Garnett. All those guys are gone. And by the grace of God, I'm still here, They're alive and kicking. But you have to change along the way. You can't live the life that you used to live like when you were 20. You have to take care of this, and if you take care of it, I stop smoke. Mm -hmm. I come to think of it, I used to smoke two and a half packs a day. Sometimes it's mind-boggling to me how I did it. Plus the, you know what I'm talking about, the good stuff. <laughs> Back in the early 70s, Bob Dylan and Paul Simon were hanging out together in New York. And one day, uh, Bob Dylan kept playing a Jimmy Cliff song over and over and over again called Vietnam, which Dylan said was the best protest song ever written. And Paul was so inspired by this song that he flew to Jamaica and booked the same studio, the same engineer, and the same musicians to do his huge hit, Mother and Child Reunion. Yeah, a great period for him. He was one of the first American artists. Later you had Peter Gabriel, David Byrne, who kind of subsumed world music into American pop music. 
uh, I, I always loved a record by the Twinkle Brothers where, that they recorded in Poland where they kind of reversed the thing and took European folk music and laid some drum and bass to the bottom of the thing and kind of took that music back into reggae, you know. So um, the, the crossover between Jamaicans being inspired by American music and Americans uh, uh, turning on to the great Jamaican music from the early days, it's, it's really an amazing story. And it's what all musicians love to do, you know. I, I, I always thought that categorization was the boon and the bane of the music business. If you want to sell records, you've got to have a country section and a bluegrass section and a folk section. But if you want to play music, you want to play like Willie Nelson, jazz guitar over a country <laughs> song, you know, uh, mix it up. You had all those rock and roll groups in the late 60s that wanted to play country music. And then there came a time where every rock group had to have at least one reggae-ish song on their album, you know, uh, it's part of the great communication of music. Well, no one really identified Mother and Child Reunion at the time as a reggae song, but they did when they heard I Shot the Sheriff by Eric Clapton, and that was such a groundbreaking record, so crucially important, not only to breaking Bob Marley as a major international artist, but the form of reggae music. It was suddenly legitimized by the biggest guitar hero of, of the day, Eric Clapton, and George um, supervised many, many different takes on that, and I'm sure he has some fascinating things to say about those sessions. Well, and it's funny how, you know, I remember some kids coming into a record store I worked in and saying, hey, do you have that new Blondie song? And realizing that they were looking for a classic Paragon's tune that Blondie had covered, uh, and uh, so it's very interesting how some of the music got filtered, you know, but still turned on a lot of people to go looking for the Roots music. And didn't George Raymond uh, engineer both versions of I Shot the Sheriff, both Bob Marley's and Eric Clapton's? Yeah, he worked on, well, we, we will show you what he worked on. Here are some of the records that George Raymond helped engineer. Bob Marley's first solo album in 1974, Natty Dread, uh, one of the best reggae albums of all time, one of the most militant anthem-filled records ever. He also worked on the album that Time magazine called the best album of the 20th century, Exodus, in 1977. And if you're going to bracket Marley's career with major statements of militancy, you begin in 74 with Natty Dread and then in 79 with what many critics consider to be his most important statement, the Survival Album. And the following year, the last album of his life, Uprising. George Raymond worked on every one of those records. Yeah, um, I just understand that you did uh you are a part of the sound part of um, Smile Orange, the yes. movie. I was the engineer on Smile Orange in 1976. It was done at Federal Records. <laughs> section was no no gen original no gen and then we did all the track in there produced by a very good friend of mine Mel Ballistan she was fantastic and then we took it in and synced it to the film mm -hmm. 
that was it. And you can do the film and see the sound of 1976. Yeah, the sound. This, the, I, I listened. I watched a movie recently and well, the sound. It, it sound good. I mean, it, it coming in and out at the right time. Well, that's that's me the, phasing, phasing mm -hmm. it in and out mm -hmm. to the movie with the sync clock. Yeah. That was big hit in Jamaica, man. Well, it was similar to what they have in what they had no idea with Boys in the Hood. Mm. A big hit, mm. sold out, you know. Smile Orange, man. Jamaica. And it was, and it was, some of the scenes were kind of what we call pornographic. You know, there were a lot of ladies mm. booty shaking and mm. stuff like that in the hotel. It was nice, it was a nice film. Mm. You know what I mean? So the, 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 the children could watch it, it wasn't that graphic. Well, I recently read an article mm -hmm. um, that was published, and it was speaking about Lynn Tate. Oh. Um, and it mentioned specifically that he was a Trinidadian who was doing session work in Jamaica at the time. That's true. And the article says that he gets credit for the collaboration of the creation of Rocksteady. That's true. There was a lot of people involved, but he was one of the instigators. But you see, you must remember, you know, Lynn Tate, you had Lynn Tate and the Comets, and Lynn Tate and the, and the Jets, right? And he was the one that created the chip chip, that type of thing. And there was a little confrontation between guitarists him and Rupert and Ken, who was the number one kingpin, you know, and Rupert said, well, by George, I mean, they see him back as, as Lynn, and I was looking at him and said, that's nice to know, but the proof is in the pudding. The only one that could get the chip close to him was Ken Lagos. The same Ken that used to play Byron and Thomas, he had it down pat. Ken is a good guitarist. Rupert is good, you know. And then you had Mr. Hawksbaum with another one. I don't know if you ever know that. And then the granddaddy of them all was Mr. Freighter. But Freighter couldn't chip if him life depend on it. I mean, the vintage chip, mm -hmm. but him had the most style. Nanny Goat, mm -hmm. and you know, Ken Boosting, Freedom Street. That's the granddaddy, Freighter. Mm -hmm. When you talk about the chip, you talk about it. Yeah, and, uh, and there's few people can do that. It's not, it's not very many people. Ken, come, can Ken is the closest. Tight, tight, tight. Mm -hmm. Ken is the closest. Mm -hmm. Rupert Bent is good, you know. But Rupert Bent and Mr. The one that I'm um, playing. Um, Jan around by me. Um, uh, only wrangling. Only wrangling. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Only wrangling. I'm yeah, Mr. Yeah. Rupert Bent. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. you know, technically, right. But mm -hmm. I'm rough. Rough edge. Mm -hmm. The roots. You know, mm -hmm. all the jazzy sound. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I might get myself in trouble, but the truth is the truth. You know what I mean? You get yourself in trouble, man. So. <laughs> I am a custom <laughs> trait. <laughs> Take the beat in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a custom trait. So it's about the catch up. What is your future? That's not to do with me. Is your future without the board? So how would you see your future? My future now is um, doing my autobiography. I'm going to also be writing a book with Mr. Carl Grant, who was officially with um, Bill Essential. Right. Excellent. Where are you going, Don Shaw? Uh, oh, excellent. Don Shaw is, uh, what a name, Don Shaw? What a name. Philip Gaza. Gaza, man. Yeah. Wicked, man. <laughs> we look at him, you just know, I see him in the future. So, this is my millions future, of people. See, this the, is my future. The name is right. right. The attitude is right. right. The man is ready. Mm -hmm. I wish the best. <laughs> and this is part of the future here with Mr. Don Shaw. With Lala, what do you call it? Lala Bella Band. And with my guy over there, Roxwell Smith. Roxwell Smith. He's the bass man. And Benji, the guitarist. And who's the other two guys? Rene, keyboards, right. Dre. So, and then I'm also associated with this guy, Mr. Willis Stewart, from the Rhythms of Africa. And I'm um, proud to say I'm hoping to be associated with him sound wise. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. you're, you're sound already. <laughs> <laughs> you're, first of all, you're a sound mind. Right? Yeah. And two. <laughs>
Yeah, man. You know the The greatest thing, the greatest thing I find with the greatest, the greatest thing I find with with with, with Jamaica is that in the sense that up here in America you can buy parts yes so nobody fixes that in Jamaica you have to find ways mm. some of the most creative things mm. happen in the studio a man put this thing and put no. balance up a thing it and works. get a sound it but works. the greatest man will scratch oh, scratch will hear something man. and hear the crowd and leave it it's yeah. part of the sound oh, and the man yeah. sit down and what he got with Bob Marley with an A track <laughs> it, um, it, cre it changed her it was a revolutionary sound for, for the whole of record. And did, did you ever have any occasion where he was engineering any of the sessions that you played? Um, I, I, at Federal, I was never, I never did, I did more things at Dynamics. I think you, you, you did a session to re record with me, didn't you? Yes. We, we recorded what? Was it Circle? Circle. In a Circle. In a Circle. When we did, because we used to play for um, Derek Harrier. Right. And and, and, and and at that occasion, I, yeah. I think we did something. Did you do anything with Light too, Light Charmer? I think I did a couple of songs with yeah, that, but Ibu did that with that Joe. Right. 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 did a song called I See You. Yes. And he gave it to the Louvers of Jamaica, which was Funky Bone. Yes. Funky Bone was in the inner circle. Yes. And that's how I got, I was just, I was just in the right place at the right time with everybody. Mm -hmm. And Funky Bone, Tear up the tune, I see you, you know. And then yes. now, Federal in those days was known as an uptown thing. Yes. And Peter Pata, Mr. Wicker, Ernest Smith, and the clue to have it. So tomorrow when that, uh, right tomorrow's children and thing, and Mr. Ken Ku, you know, with him, John okay. Jones. No. Like yeah, John Jones was a yeah. great artist. So when Roy Chalmers and Derek Harriet came into the picture now and brought in the roots, the whole sound changed. Mm. You know? And that's how I got to work with everybody. Light Chalmers taught me a lot about production. He was, the man was a genius. The man, yes. The papa course. We used to listen to this know his song inside out. And then come on to a concert by just and then when I was listening to um, Life is just for living the other day, before I even met Josh listen to the harmonies of the voice and it was just amazing and in terms of my sister was doing that thing. Yes, was yes. SPM. Yes, SPM, my sister was yes, really because when we were playing, how I, I, I know your sister is because they were in a group called SPM with the three same, of them from Andrews. Yeah. And then we had a chance because I was in a, in a circle at that time mm -hmm. and um, we had a chance to play at Andrews Girls School with Bob Mm -hmm. Peter mm -hmm. and Bonnie Whaler. Uh -huh. That was the first time we jammed with them there at the girls' school. It went crazy. And the SPMs came on as an opening act and they they sounded great mm -hmm. and we backed them up. Mm -hmm. In fact, it went beyond, yeah, that was in a circle. They did circle one band. album yes. similar to the age of Aquarius. Right. With, um, you know? right. But Sydney, but Philip was Street was, that was father was Sam Street. It's Sam Street, right, Dr. Sam, Sam Street. And Mary and my sister was the M, SPM. Right, right, right. And they was basically based at Dynamics. Mm. And I used them firstly on Johnny Nash, hold me tight. Yes, yes. Mm. So anytime I went back in with Ernest Smith, and Ernest, I just called on. by and I said, I'm coming over for them. Mm. No question asked. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, but but if, let's go over in part of Dynamics when the, the over there. You remember when um, the story... Carlton Lee. The Carlton Lee. <laughs> but, but, but the story with Carlton Lee, you remember how that there was a Range Rover always parked over there? Yeah. You know how the Range Rover, the big Range Rover get over there? It was um, Rolling Stones when they came to yeah. the Goat Head or something, their album. Mm -hmm. Remember that album that they... The man said they want to check the studio. The man decided to play football. <laughs> in wow. the studio, I pay for everything they mash up. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, the joke is, I listen, the man said, listen, the man going now, I think it's me, me mm -hmm. go and say, listen, I have to catch a plane, mm -hmm. hold the key. Um, oh, leave the, oh, oh, the, the, the Range Rover. <laughs> for two, three years, <laughs> Range Rover Park, they leave. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, they had, the man and go call the hotel and decide they want to check out the hotel. The man and put a thing, some show the TV in the water, and they pay for the whole hotel. But go back into those times of okay, give give give, give us an instance of how you thought of the artists in those days, though. Um, uh, Judge, how how did you feel when when you had to record with the artists, like moods and and things? 
in what was recorded, what was it thinking in your mind of how you could better it? Because you, you, out of key, there was no auto tune then. So, how strict how strict were you on the key? Keep on on key because that was a more. Well, I don't well, know. You must remember, you know. Uh, you have ever met Mr. Ken Cooley? Yes, I've, I never know him that well, but now I see him. Well, when I joined, it was West Indies Records. Right. And then it split and become Dynamics and Federal. Mm -hmm. And I stayed with Federal. And Goodall went to Dynamics, Graham Goodall went to Dynamics. Mm -hmm. But in those days, you know, it was just from the studio to the control room and Ken Cooley cut the acetate with him hand. And him say one time, any musician that fall down, him can pay for the acetate. Because sometimes, you know, you're cutting it right away. And then when two tracks come in on everything. So, you have to learn how to pre-mix. You're doing everything live, you know. There's no such thing as catch it in the mix or overdub, you know. Right, right, right. When a man take a solo, you have to bring him up, put on him reflex, bring him down. You know? So everything was done on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the fly. Yeah. And it was really what we were doing is as, as improvising right. as much as possible. And those <laughs> days musicians would be, hey, I work with the scatter lights mm -hmm. from Jump Street. Right. Don Jumon. Mm -hmm. My Marvin Black Cap and everything. I don't know. You have Tommy McCook and all that. And Don Jumon said, George, you're on the tape. And when you come back to the top, just press the red button. You have to pay Don Jumon to miss him. The man don't miss. No, the man don't miss. And also, you don't miss. Then, so let's go back into something there. You talk about Dan Drummond. When Dan Drummond had to go away on a tour, mm -hmm. there's two ways when himself Rocksteady changed from from Scat to, to Rocksteady. Rock and there was two, there's, there's two school of thought. One school of thought that, that the people were tired of dancing so fast. Yeah, right, and right, right. they want to say, slow down till Joe Gibbs and the money. Slow it down. But the other school of thought is that when Dan Drummer left, man couldn't play that fast technically. <laughs> <laughs> so from yeah. you from some herb smoke, the beats are yeah man could <laughs> became rock steady. Since yeah, but rock steady. Uh, so I don't know which song. Yeah, I would I, yeah, I don't yeah, know which song. Okay, well that's that, okay because I was just saying earlier <laughs> that there was an article about Lynn Tate. Lynn Tate was a man who from Trinidad. And oh, told and asked yeah. and asked them to slow it down. Yeah. He was the one that asked. Actually, the article says made the suggestion. Can you slow it down just a bit? Well, well, that's his baby one because you could have played. Because if you're playing, you have to yeah, look at yeah, him yeah. is the one that that, that yeah. middle. Ding, 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 I don't remember Lynn Tate. Tate. Yeah, I remember you said it. Lynn Tate yeah. and Rupert Bent and Hux Brown. But yeah, Rupert, Rupert, I think. Hux Brown was a man that any uh. session you went play, that's an axe man. Mm -hmm. When he played, kick, 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 kick. kick. Yeah, May I tell you, it, 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 those were the sessions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if they did. And Brubeck, you call Brubeck mm -hmm. um, the same Winston yeah, Rice. Winston Rice. Winston Rice. Pat Belly. But Pat Belly, they yeah. call him. But Winston Man, but they, them was a man I used to sit it down. And when they come, sit down. They were the ones who ran most, but a lot of my, one of the greatest drummer who's been, I keep on saying, who's on that, no, has not been told in history, is, is Paul Douglas. Paul Douglas played for all no, the sessions there, sure. a lot, and even when the foreign musician come, I'm going to read. So yeah. because of that, it yeah. was sit down, all yeah. some of them money came and thinking, is this him playing on the song then? This is true because it was a, it I, was did, a, I did a, I did a, a album called Gold Connection, mm. right? Mikey Boo was sick. Right. Um, Mikey Boo was another right. top, top session. He was the session original right. now, Jen, with, with um, Dougie. Mm. Right. And we called Paul. Yeah. And it's like the two of them just lock up like that. Mm. And after a while, Paul Douglas and then, then um, Mikey Chung. My, well, Jeffrey Chung. Jeffrey and Mikey away. Chung. Jeffrey. Then Willie Lindo came in the Jeffrey, scene. Yes, Willie came in and take right. So there was certain man who was definitely... The, the, there was a session, session man, man when the man had come and sit down. Man, the man was miss. going to, they would go dynamics, boom, federal, yeah. boom. Uh, Joe, um, Gibbs, Joe Gibbs, but it's the like studio. they must live in a studio. They don't play on stage. They don't right. have to play on no, stage. Jen, don't play on stage. Yeah, man, it, yeah, they 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 just uh, 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 Robbie Lynn, Lynn. Yeah. the incredible. If you play a fan, because mm. what a lot of like, even Bob, because of 
go back years ago, then you listen to Cuban music coming, not Cuban music, the radio, American radio in Guantanamo mm. Bay would play the music. And that is where they used to hear the jazz. Mm. A man hear it from there as a rat. And then I'm saying, let's change it. It's a blue beat. And that's how it goes. But look at the white, look at, look, look, but look at the one love. One love it, 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 it is my Curtis Mavis yeah. song. Mm -hmm. People get ready. Yeah, what those days, man? What, what's my film? Robbie Lynn played with the Wheelers for a while. Mikey Chung played with Bob, mm -hmm. with Peter for a while. Right. It's a revolution. Right. And, and there's a little short guy. I don't mean to call him. Um, short, him play keyboard, man. Excellent. All recordings, him do too. What's um, his name? Bird? No, man. It, you know, man, what do you name your name? Keith was one. Keith, Keith and, and there was another guy. Like you say, it's like him have a Spanish name. Like you say, come out of Mountain View. But man, he could have played a keyboard. But boy, you had session man, session man them that went and go on the session and come together. You know. But but let me tell you something. My boy, Robbie Lynn, mm. if you bring a foreign sound in him, man, he would have gone cover him okay. again. You wouldn't get back to exactly. You, you the man was a scientist, but... Jackie Mitchell it was a whole different thing. And what's the other guy who play? When he play, he play all them frills around it. Jackie was one. And another one. What's his name? You're not talking about Harold Butler. No, Harold Butler was one of the great one. But the one I'm talking about, man. You know him, man. Not Harold Butler. Um, he, he play piano. When he play, there's a, the, his name is on my head. He, we get an age where he's great. Leslie Butler. Leslie Butler was another person. But I'm talking about... When it came to Gladdy, 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 Gladstone, Gladdy, Gladstone, 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 Gladstone,
I was at Miles State. I was at uh, this saxophone player who died. Anyway, it was who should I know? I can't remember his name. I don't mind, I can't remember his name, but um, King somebody. Not, King Curtis? Yeah, that's what his name King Curtis. I was at his next party and Stevie Wonder was there, and I bumped into Miles Davis, and I said, Who are you? He said, Oh, Miles Davis. I said, Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a good laugh, and, and, and uh, he was there, and Stevie was there, some other people there, and um, we had a party going, and so, um, like I just got off the phone, speaking with Stevie Wonder, we were exchanging ideas, and he was, he's mad with me because I went and got an Android phone. I changed my phone instead of sticking with the iPhone, mm -hmm. changed it to the Android. And he, so they were making fun out of me about that. Um, anyway, music is my first lady. She treat me good. good. Well, you know, um, as you know, you know my history. I think you know where I'm coming from. You know, I am not, I'm not a regular engineer. Really. I'm an engineer, period. Yeah. But I, I grew up in the culture. Well, you grew up being an engineer, period, because you know what? You got a great set of headphones. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I got. Okay, so now somebody call you to do what you know how to do. And it's great, some people just don't, you know, some people stop at certain points. But you know, I was in the right place at the right time. I grew up in the culture. I understand the mix of the reggae. You but know where I want to go? <coughs> I want to go to Jamaica. Never been? I want to go to Jamaica yeah. and play some music. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. You'll be surprised. A lot of people have heard about you. I've oh, yeah. heard about you, but I've never met you until I was with um, Patrick Ross doing the album. Oh, okay. But I've heard about Ricky Williams. You know what I mean? Oh, but yeah. I, I enjoy a good gospel session. Gospel is getting very big now. You know? It should have been big a long time ago. I don't know what, what you know. Yeah. I'm working, in fact, I'm working on a gospel album, so. Do you need an engineer? Of course. Well, here's one. All right. Give me your hand. I'll do it for you. Thank you, Terry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. right. I, I got your best. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a human being like everybody else. I can't lose with the stuff we use. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, so, you know, I am very particular. I'm a very fussy individual. Yeah. Could, could if it's be. not going right, I will pull it down and pull it apart until I get it. Yeah, we're supposed to. Yeah. You're a perfectionist. Don't worry about it. I am too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, That's, That's why he was giving me a warm time at the house. The, about the keyboard. You never mentioned guitars. You never mentioned drums. Just the keyboards. I can play a whole reggae song with, 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 and play the bass and all that. Oh, yeah. But we got my man over here <laughs> to play the bass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I said, we can't leave you out because, you know, right. The time you're ready. We got things in common. Look at that amplifier over there. <laughs> yeah, he's a good bass man. He played with a band that I was affiliated with. I, I, the Mighty Vikings. But he, he was with them for a while, the Vikings. Okay. Yeah. But, you know, and I think he's pretty flexible. He played a little drums too. Yeah. Okay. I like playing reggae drums. Yeah. The drums and the bass. Yeah. Get that luck. Uh -huh. Rock that luck. Do you know a brother of mine? A good friend of mine named Willie Stewart. He was the third world. Play reggae. Willie Stewart. He has a, he has a thing know. going, Rhythms of Africa. Ah, uh, okay. I don't know any, anybody from third world. The band, the band. The band, I don't know anybody from third world. Oh. I know this guy named, you know Julio? Julio Perez? Guitar player. Yeah, man. Julio, yeah. Julio Perez? Who's Julio Perez? He's a, he's a sound engineer too? Sound engineer. Yeah, he's a sound engineer. Yeah, he's a sound Oh, that that's one. You know Gilly? <laughs> if I know Gilly, I can tell you stories about Gilly. Gilly was Bob's cook. He used to cook. Oh, okay. Well, he used to, I used to record in Gilly's studio. Yes, Icos record. Icos. Yeah, I used to in record over there. Yeah. Icos, right there. In, in uh, 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 and Julio, great. Maybe engineer. That's where I saw he was my engineer. Hold on, maybe that's. 
You used to be an actor. I used to do a lot of work at I. You know a guy named Famous? Yes. You know Crazy Famous? Oh my God. No, Gary had a studio called Icos Records. It was in a warehouse district. Yeah, yeah but and they were over there by King, King, King. 120, King. all the way down to the back. Yeah. In a warehouse thing. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, I know Famous. Mm -hmm. Famous is crazy. Mm -hmm. So I love him, you I love know him. Gilly. I know oh, Gilly. Yeah. In fact, I got Everybody Gilly. Everybody know Gilly, Patrick. Yeah, I got Gilly number somewhere. Gilly. I have it. The man called me and said, I want to talk to me. I said, well, I charge for consulting fees. You said, but charge me a friend. But you know, yeah, you know, you know, uh, soft, you know, mixing boards and software are so great because you know what, you can engineer anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you don't need to make big consoles anymore. Uh, as long as you got your headphones on, you can hear what you want and you can get what you want. I I agree and I just he just learned that with my session. Thank you very much. I'm his first the, his the first in his the first box. in the box the session. Engineer in the box. Okay, and it gets even better than that. But you know. I don't know if you agree with me. Analog will never die. Analog will never die. Right? So I'm, oh. when I say analog, microphones, live drums, you know? Oh, yeah. You get the, the oomph, you get the, the, the contact. In fact, in a minute, in a minute, I'm going to have me a, a great mixing board, and I'm going to have a drum set and everything will everything in my garage. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna have Pro Tools, I'll be using Pro Tools because Pro Tools is great. I know. But you know, I mean I use I like to use Pro Tools and stuff in the overdubbing. But the basic rhythm tracks have to be analog. And then I can Well mix. guess what? You can you can I mean you can you can get that analog analog pro tools. Yeah, and, and, and you use a and you, and you use going in. You use a mixing board, mm -hmm. analog mixing board. Well, the first experience I had was at Patrick's last place when I did the, the in the box. Okay, venture. You know, a lot of people thought I did it at Criteria, but hey, it was there, sounding uh, new stuff, every type of stuff. You know, compressors even. You know. Yeah. Remember Patrick? That, that really impressed me. Yeah. Yeah. What it is is that what it is is the downside. Mm -hmm. the, you know everything. But you know, I I was old school in this big control room with this big Neve or Harrison board. Right. Well, you know they, they got Harrison boards. They got Harrison. Even though know, we don't have the money, but we, they got Harrison boards that can work. With a computer. I know that's what I was just telling you. Yeah. When I was mixing this Aquarius, Age of Aquarius, what's the part? Age of Aquarius, yes. love yourself. I said, well, I'd like a compressor. He said, what you like? Neva Harrison. And the man bring it up, you know. And I could set the ratio, the all sorts of things. Yeah. I had a child with Harrison, Neve, different output. Why is he on the book? Yeah, I said, right. And I'm there, I'm saying, um, Patrick, a little more highs, this, that, that, it sounds just like I'm in a control room. You don't have the tape noise, you know? That's right. That's right. Yeah. And no bleeding, no bleeding. No bleeding. Yeah. But one thing, you, with the analog, you have to have a little bleed to get the human effect. You can't make it sound too clinical. I like the little human effect. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. What, what you do with that is you take a little um, plug in with that, it's got a little base, and, and you put that underneath. <laughs> so you put. <laughs> yeah. So at the moment now, I teach. I'm putting my stuff together, passing it on to the youths and stuff like that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Which youth that? Because every time you talk about something, you say, oh, what are my secrets? Then we wait, turn off the tape. Don't want nobody to know my secrets. So who, 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 who are you teaching I will be, I will be one of them in the segment with the guitar. You know, what I meant, how I do my rhythm guitar, my acoustic rhythm guitar, you know? Right. And 
Oh, it's old, it's old now. How you go how you do it is a different thing. I would make it from inside. Oh okay. yeah. You know, so you well, tell Ricky your secret for, for, for recording pianos. Ah, piano. Okay. <laughs> okay. A grand piano. You know a grand piano? Yeah. A baby grand. With mics. Okay, I get I get two nine minus forty sevens. Or oh, one forty seven and eighty seven and I wrap it in tissue and I tape it inside the piano. And I close the lid and put an acoustic blanket over it. That hole. So I use the I use the 47 for the top end and the 87 for the bottom end. And I record it in stereo. There you go. Hmm? There you go. There you go. You can edit that out. <laughs> now you know they got this they got this they got this, they got this um, program, right? Yeah. It's called uh, Ivory. And Ivory has the greatest baby grand acoustic sound you ever want to hear. Mm. Right? Mm. And and so now what you do with 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 your secret, Ivory's even better than that. Mm -hmm. And you hear the sound, the sample of an actual baby grand. They got one for the they got one for the um Yamaha. Mm -hmm. uh, the German made piano mm -hmm. and you sit down and you can control the hammers, mm -hmm. you can adjust the hammer, but it sounds straight out the box like a baby grand piano. Well, the studio that I was chief engineer at I had a form of pin tonic, we had a big grand big, 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 big. And we used to tune it every month. I did a couple of piano solos in there, piano artists. Right. Just, just, and what I would do, I would open this piano to the full length and put two mics over it, right? right? And then put another two mics and record a room song and blend everything together. Okay. Um, I think that's all of that. And, and let me tell you something. In the different rooms and everything. Let me tell you something. You see, when I open up, when you had tongue eyes, right? And when oh, you yeah. Open, uh, and when, I, when I go in the control room and open it up and blend everything yeah. and add the reverbs, I that like is like having ecstasy. I like to know it's good. <laughs> yeah. We are from a pin to an anchor. We yeah. had big EMT plates, everything. Yeah. Federal records, you can look it up. Yeah, MTM. Big. Yeah. Yeah. George, yeah. How you, tell me a little about the transition to live recording or you know how did that come about because and also like you're talking about these boards and in the studio Fiction. when you do live how what's the difference when you're well, studying you that? have certain boards that are just built for studio certain boards are just built for live mm -hmm. right and in jamaica i didn't get too much in the live i did festivals and then i did shows with bob and stuff like that I didn't do, I didn't get into the live thing until I resided in um, California. But I did other things like Bob Marley days and you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. When I went into California now, that's when my life
from then we've been talking. <coughs> Sorry, I reformed a little relationship. And I gave you two songs to modify for me, remember? Yes. Back in the day, remember Silver Convention did a lot of things like Fly Robin Fly and all that sort of stuff. So I, I co-produced a album called Cool Connection with a friend of mine, Lloyd Chalmers. We read it um, by our love team and stuff. And um, I love him. <laughs> It coming out. Besides, no respect. Age of Aquarius is my first. Me tell you something. Nobody's doing it, right? No. And nobody's doing that, right? It's sound different. So when it when it when it come out, it sound fresh. It gonna be oh man, wow. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. And, but I would like on the arm, draw his mood, and I can add what background voices. You just gotta figure out what you want to do with those. Background voices and that's it. Okay, background voice. Live yeah, background voice. Well, I know some background singers. In fact, I know one girl that can do it all, actually. Yeah, that's good. Let's talk about some of the other songs that George has worked on. Scotty, Sesame Street. Just a delightful takeoff on the American television show by the um, prototypical rapper. Scotty himself. And, and he actually did, uh, 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 years later, do a rap record, by the way. Uh, uh, many years later, he did a CD where he raps. Uh, but uh, those great early, uh, based on, you know, children's nursery rhymes, uh, 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 so much great, Sesame Street, you know, another one by him, the classic Breakfast in Bed, where he answers back, Lorna Bennett's vocal, you know, uh, uh, definitely one of my favorite early DJs, Scotty. Then there's Ken Booth, Mr. Rocksteady. George worked on Leaving Me, Freedom Street, Second Chance, just one classic after another. Yeah, those great Lloyd Charmer productions, that, that really was Ken Booth kind of a second life. He had all those great Studio One hits, but really the, the Lloyd Charmer's things brought him uh, to a greater international standing. He sure. also did Second Chance, Puppet on a String, Everything I Own. <laughs> the list, it seems, almost endless. Um, we have George working with Marcia Griffiths as a solo artist and B.B. Seaton. That's in his 70s work. So in the mid-70s, as reggae was beginning to break seriously internationally, an album appeared by the Mighty Diamonds called Right Time, an absolute classic, a landmark with new rhythm changes, roots rock reggae at its percussive best. It's an album I've never stopped playing. It's always been in my all-time top ten reggae records. Great, great harmony trio, uh, incredible live, did so many great, great records, but that's the classic album yeah. by the Mighty Diamonds for sure. And now we come to one of the most important records for so many different reasons that has ever been released in Jamaica. And it is called Dadawa by Ross Michael and the Sons of Negus, uh, 75. And in 76, uh, when I made my first trip to Jamaica, I heard it on a hillside in Lucy in a little tiny hut. 
and I went all over the island looking for a copy and couldn't find it anywhere. And when I got back to San Francisco in Trenchtown Records on Fillmore Street, I found three copies. Um, this is a Nyabingi Graunation, a Rastafarian religious gathering that George had to mic in a studio, and I believe it was the RJR studio that mm. he recorded this in. And it had to have a real authentic live feel, and that's very tricky. And not too many people can do that. The uh, overdubs were done with the vocals later on. But to get that peculiar mix of drumming and chanting all at once is remarkable. And uh, I, I would love to hear George talk more about how he might that particular album. And the segue is the, the, each side seems continuous, you know. It just seems like it's all one uh, experience, the way that it's uh, uh, done. Obviously, uh, he worked to edit it and put it together that way, but the end result of it is that you really have the feeling that you're up in the hills experiencing a, a Nyabingi so. It's, it's absolutely haunting. And each of the four tracks, very, very long, the original versions were much longer than that. And uh, Paul Douglas was on drums, and uh, George Raymond has called it one of my greatest achievements mm -hmm. as an engineer, and I would certainly agree with that. Yes. I'm an independent engineer. He's up now those tours and sessions with his profit. You know, I've toured with Pato Bantam, you know, I've worked with Twinkle Brothers, two Sunny Me tours, I did three tours with them. I worked with Peter Bob, Andrew Tash. I was affiliated with Steve Coyles up to Babylon and the Bandit. Touch bases with. Um, I did the first four sun splashes for Tony Johnson, Synergy. Those were the heavyweights that those days sun splash, those sun splash. Yeah. You had all these big wigs, Spear and Toots. And... No, I don't know what they have going on. We got different vibes. Mm -hmm. So I was very fortunate to be around in those days. 60s coming up, you know. I met a lot of good friends, a lot of good musicians along the way, studio musicians. Slave Queen, Judy Mowat, one of the I3 from her first solo album, recorded at uh, Dynamics and Harry J and Channel One with George Raymond as one of its engineers. Um, a lot of people think that's still the greatest female album of all time in Jamaica. It's certainly up there with the best. Great, great record, you know, and a a absolutely. Judy Mowat, still a great singer, but certainly uh, at the top of her form uh, uh, with that record. So you are a producer and a de facto engineer with your own label, Chuck. Um, what is it about an engineer that is so essential to a successful production? We tend to talk a lot about the singers and then from there talk about the producers. Uh, I love having musicians on my radio show and talking with people who actually played on the records, but we seldom talk about what it actually takes to, to take the concept of a song and turn it into a record, you know. Uh, it, when I first started going into the studios, we were recording on two-inch tape uh, in the early days in Jamaica, everything was done live, or as you say, do the backing track live and then overdub the vocals. We're in a completely different situation now where we're recording digitally and you can punch in and you can fix. I mean, we used to cut the tape to, if the drummer made a mistake, to cut it and splice it back together if a beat got dropped. And we're in a completely different world in the digital realm. But to go back into the time when George was working and to come out with these pristine recordings, I, I, I mean, to me, 
as an American, I didn't start out listening to the early ska and the early Rocksteady and Studio One recordings and Treasure Isle. Our introduction in America were these island records recorded at Federal Records, George Raymond doing the engineering on, uh, on these songs like Many Rivers to Cross by Jimmy Cliff, which was probably the song that brought me into reggae. What is this? This is fantastic. This has got everything that the blues has, but it's being done right now, and the recording is clean and crisp, and that's one of the uh, things where I really have to take my hat off to George Raymond and the work that he did. It doesn't have a lot of reggae is raw, and when you listen to artists like Toots and the Maytals, you get that totally vibrant moment of life that's what recording is all about. When you actually get something, again, I'll say on a tape because that's the way we started out doing it, when you actually get a soulful moment, and there are thousands of soulful moments in reggae that have managed to get captured onto record and pressed onto wax, it's uh, to me, it's amazing in this time, because you can go back to the 30s and listen to Mississippi John Hurt and John Lee Hooker and some artists who really got some raw emotion onto the recording. But a lot of the recordings that we hear today, they just don't have that, because we're recording in a completely different kind of an environment, and you have the wonderful opportunity to fix your mistakes. Uh, it's, a, it's a very different style of recording from there, and the engineer is the person who is able to translate that soulful moment into a final work. I think what George did was truly understand how everything had to fit together in its own place because he was a musician initially, he was a bass player. And you have a, a drum and George has to decide whether to mic for the rim or the skin and whether he wants to record the bass directly or live in the studio. And all of these go together to make the final picture. It's like a huge Rubik's Cube. In what way do you twist it to make it look the very, very best or sound the very, very best? And that's what George was particularly good at. Every little piece is an important part of that puzzle, and every little piece has to be right. True, and it's important to remember that the music was totally in flux during this time. In those early ska recordings, they were playing a stand-up bass. In Rocksteady, suddenly you have the electric bass and a whole different set of issues to deal with. By the time you have reggae, the instruments have moved around. Things are playing very differently. In reggae, a lot of people think, oh, reggae is one thing. But there were all these different elements. Uh, if you really listen to classic reggae recordings, you, you, Peter Tosh, for instance, he's not just playing ch 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 He's doing a lot of stuff on his guitar. He's moving around a lot. And that's one of the great things that you have in reggae is, even within the context of a Jimmy Cliff album or a Bob Marley album, there are all these different things going on in different songs. And you're talking about miking the drums. A lot of people don't realize that you tune the drums to each individual song. A song is in a key. That drum has to vibrate to that key. It, when you're re, you, it's not like you're re, you, oh, let's record a whole album right now. You basically have to set up for each song. And, and you have all these factors, including psychological factors, when you're dealing with the various artists and singers, you know, to deal with the, the many different personalities uh, um, and still have that technical expertise to be on top of it and to capture that moment. Because that's the important thing, I think, in all music, is capturing the moment when the thing really sounds unique and good. And they trusted him. I've known George a long, long time. I think I did my first interview with him on the Reggae Beat in 82. And he has a calm center. He knows that he knows how to do this. Song is song. What they do in the Reggae or Gospel. Song, frequency is frequency. I'm, I'm fortunate that I was born in Jamaica and I know the relationship with the bass and drum. But what they do now? A kick with a rock and roll, a kick. It's frequency. 
in Jamaica we call it the death charge. You know, over here, the back beat is whatever you're doing. Sneer is sneer, hat is hat, or is frequency. But with the reggae, I understand the blend. That's it. So I'm very fortunate that I can do rock and roll gospel and the reggae. And that's why people like Paul Simon and Eric Clapper, Tim Bone, and you, the reggae musician, Johnny Nash, when he, when he did I Can See Clearly Now, it was Fab Five that did the rhythm track. The reggae musician. So, we in Jamaica, we know the reggae, we know the rock and roll, because we transpose all those songs from the rock and from the, into reggae. People like Alta Nevis and John Poult and all those guys. Some call it lovers rock, you know what I mean? It's the same thing. You know what I mean? So I'm here to set the record straight. That whoever thinks analog is in the grave is sadly mistaken. <laughs> yeah man. So Mr. Dancha sir. Yes, kind of, we want to know a little bit about yours. So, uh, the name is yes, fantastic. I really, I see, I see you breaking. Whether I, I, I live to see it or before, but mm. I see you breaking big barriers. So. All right. I want to mm. hear what you have to say. Well, just working now in the studio on some recordings, so trying to finish up an album and get that out there and start promoting and. Give us and, a little bit of your music. What, 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 what is your concept as a young artist out there? What is your concept? What is it that you want to tell people or what's the message you want to get out there? Well, I think just trying to keep the, the message positive. You know, I still, you know, obviously there's a lot of music out there that is very successful and it, you know, degrade women and do all these things. Yes. And sure, that's popular and everything, but it just don't sit with me. So, you know, I keep continue to do positive music and you can still bring elements, you know, uh, urban sounds and modern things and, while still, you know, respecting these boundaries, but um, yeah, that's the that's the idea, just to to, to do that, and kind of start now blending some more, uh, reggae, but with so also some Latin uh, right. influences, which is which is the biggest thing now, and Afro beat ah, influences, bigger, even big, big, yeah. big, big, huge. So that would be the the, the kind of the key think? moving forward, after, you know. How did you get involved with um, reggae? Or how did you how did that come about? With reggae, that's well, something that, that was the first a lot of thing people you heard? ask me that, and, yeah. and and I don't have like a great answer, but I always like to say that they found me because mm. I kind of caught the bug, you know, the reggae bug, and and that was it. Okay, but some what kind of what, what artist them, what music? Well, what, 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 what we young? When you, originally, what, what, when you're young, like many people, Bob, definitely the, the the what led you know led you in. But then I mean, I I really like um, I really like Capleton and Sizzla mm. and. I like Luciano. Luciano is one of my favorite artists, and um, and besides that, I listen to a lot of salsa music and, and some Afro beat and a little variety. I used to like classic. Richards, uh, Richards, uh, original. But the key, the key is is, is we can stay together with the same concept. Right. But what yeah. happened is that in groups, egos and one egos, and then people change. Mm -hmm. Like, if music could be pure, where you mm -hmm. stay. First of all, economics yeah. have a lot to do with it. You yeah. start your brethrens together. You mm -hmm. come up. Yeah. Then a little money coming back. No, like first of all, women start coming. Oh, oh, right. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Women, women play first. a lot <laughs> yeah, of parts true. in yeah. fashion for fun <laughs> because oh, you're doing this and that. And being young, the economics is one. Right. And then you have friends that influence you. You mm -hmm. have to be very, very careful because mm. from you go there, people say, oh, did this that. You have to be, in other words, the man them have to be solid. Mm. Then you have record companies, and then you're in a whole Before different world. Yeah. Because no record company want to see a group, because they don't want to deal with seven or eight right, people. Right, right, right. So they prefer to take a one, one yeah. person or two. Yeah. Okay. They think like that. So, yeah. Well, really, yeah. Third World had a little dynasty going at one time. Children had a little dynasty. But what him say about women? It's true. The base marks bachelor. His wife said, well, boy, I'm going to Canada. Oh, yeah. So that they come in with me, so I don't come at all. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, well, many things get into to, to music right, shop. Right. You know that? Concepts. Mm. If you are saying Rasta, mm. and another man is saying this, yeah, or you're saying Christianity, mm. or 
people's beliefs. So you have to be clear if it's music, where is it? Mm. Again, concepts of, 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 of where are you going? Mm. Where do you see the band? Right. How do you see yourself? Mm. So one has to have that. The, the music is pure. Mm. Yeah. But what happens is that the people change their expectations. Right. Yeah, mess up. Mess up. Uh, would you agree I think with about me? the record company. Yeah. Would you agree as with a me? hand in that, that, that is a, well, that is I'm a thing. I throw a couple more things in the pot. Greed and envy. Well, that is anything, any business you go yeah, in, yeah. anything, yeah, yeah, yeah. anything or that. And as anything you grow in life, mm -hmm. your expectations, if you're in a band and you have to, you, you want, you have expenses, suppose you mm -hmm. want to drive a Porsche, mm -hmm. right. it might not agree with what's happening with the, the, band, the group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to start somewhere. Yeah. So you have to be able to, everybody has to have a, a, an idea. So, okay, a timeline. Mm. We want to go in four years, we're going to put this in, mm. we're going to do this and try and reach that. Right. But people's expenses change. Mm. I mean, looking at the perspective now, the key would be is if you really want to have a group, mm -hmm. the time is you need time to practice. Mm -hmm. You need time to live. If you live with your parents, is one thing. Mm -hmm. If you don't, so economics will yeah, always right play. Right. So you have mm -hmm. to do it part time, but you want to do it full time. Music is where you want to do full time. Mm -hmm. The key is if you could start something that have a business mm -hmm. that will operate itself. So it provide economic base mm -hmm. for you to be able to spend six months, eight months, nine Doing months working mm -hmm. on the, an mm -hmm. album right. and get it done, so you can spend time with each other. Mm -hmm. One of our greatest albums with Third World, well, '96 was coming in and new. That was one. Mm -hmm. But the retreat we did, we know that we fall in love with um, Journey to Addis. Mm -hmm. We went to Portland and we spent three weeks. Everybody gave up all, if there was any habits, right. none there. You get up in the morning, you train, wow. you run in the morning. I was head of athletics doing the training mm -hmm. with the man. Ibu did music lessons, yeah. Bonnie did something else. Everybody had a different thing. And by doing that, <coughs> it built us so much. Up. By the okay. time we went to recording, I saw, it's like, this, it, was like it was like you were on a whole different right, things yeah. so to me it is what mm -hmm. everybody see as going right. no Ibu, Ibu, when we left in 1997 Ibu and, and myself 1997 i said how it went is that i said well i'm going to leave the group and um i won't go into the history why or whatever but um the man said we were doing a tour in san france we we hit san francisco and was doing a big tour coming up in san diego a big, big concert there, there. And I said, listen, think about it. And by the time you come back, after, I think it was on a tour for three weeks, come back and tell us if that's what you really want to do. So after the tour in San Francisco, I said, boy, I definitely become where I'm going, you know, right. but I, I, I will help I whatever I have to do for the drama to come forward, you know. Right, I, yeah. But I think they had contact eruption sometime during that tour. And so I said, well, we move it. And that night when we had our meeting and I said that, Ibu said, well, I'm going to make a move too. So I'm shocked. Cat is shocked. Mm -hmm. God said, make a move. Can we make a move? Well, I'll have to take a good break too. And, and so it's a surprise. Ibu met me. So mm -hmm. we both left at that time in 1997. Mm -hmm. Who's on drums now? Eruption. Eruption. Eruption will play with Jimmy Cliff. And okay. this is a joke now. Mm -hmm. This joke is that we were playing. There was um, uh, Boney M came to Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And they were doing a thing and they were doing a shoot at Hilton Hotel. And I'm hearing this drummer. We're doing a video and get ready. And I'm hearing this drummer. And I'm saying, I think the, the drummer was playing. He was playing outside by the poolside, Rob mm. And I said to Kat, you hear that? That drummer can be international like a Tony Williams. He has everything. He has all that magic. Mm. And knowing that, and that we could have been 10 years, 15 years before he came into the band. Mm. And, 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 and to show you how things funny. Uh, life is. You know, life is. Uh, so to me, you know, so. As I said, so in the band, it, to me, the band is, is, is the, the, what third world played when we were together was a chemistry. Mm -hmm. It was a chemistry of mind, spirit, and body. Mm -hmm. But the thing about it is that, that um, well, after I left, I went to England. Everybody thought I was dead. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because when you leave third world, you can't, Stevie Wonder, you're not playing Stevie Wonder, Santana. Where do you go? Right. So my thing was that when I leave, I'm going to, um, I'm going to go to the hotels and do sets for the band, get right. them together and organize, have that kind of ability to be the coordinator and things right. like that. So that was my thing in my head. But then I get, there was a friend of mine in England and I ended up going to England and going there. It's like God had it that I was able to study for two years, went there, I was going to do recording. And someone said, Jetstar, 
who run it, used to run it. You know, just that, uh, even around the whole of, said to him, oh, come and do some record, because instead of maybe taking it, you could do a song and create a song for England. So I, I did it, and did, but that didn't work out. I ended up studying, and then became, and that's how I became a music facilitator. But answering your question, um, it has been brought up when Bonnie was alive, it was brought up, it didn't happen. But, that asked you to come back. You got to come back. There was people, Jamaica Tourist Board, wanted the old third world, or put together, so yeah, to put together, to play as a reunion thing, mm -hmm. to play more Bay. How long are you doing the rhythms of Africa now? About seven or eight days, nine years. Yeah. What I can say by looking at it, you enjoy it. Love it. Good. So I'm going to say, well, we'll give you anything you want. Put you up in the Taj Mahal, do anything, come back. <laughs> But, but, come back, but that's, it, that's not a no, question. No, so, no, but the, thing with the, kids, the thing with the kids is the better That's right, ending. that's right. Y yeah, the I thing with the kids... I'm going to tell but, you about but, but, the other thing nowadays... But, no, but, 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 but I said it. No, no, but it's not giving up. Or but it's not giving up. But listen, how, but, 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 but it's not, listen, when Bonnie died, mm -hmm. we we came together and played. When Carrot died, we played. But here what now, Gina is sick. Gina is dark. So actually, the man I'm going to be rehearsing here for four weeks. Is going to be playing at um, Rain Club mm. for, 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 for fundraising for her. Mm -hmm. Man, yeah. let me tell you something. It's a dangerous. Same thing with what happened is that um, Gina, she was married to Carrot, and she mm. also, Gina, was our manager, and she loved her. I mean, let me tell you, I mean, so it's stage four of cancer. Mm. Yeah, so true. we're trying to raise, that's why we're raising. So, for I have that. A ah, Facebook okay. thing. so when it came, I'm asking you a question quickly because we're wrapping up. When they asked me at the time, maybe six years ago, to do a reunion. I said, as long as the band man, we can meet, so that when we play, mm -hmm. whatever differences there was, it is, and if Third World play, Third was the type of band must play for something that is surpassed, so, yes. surpassing, you're gonna make more, or surpassed, but you come together because of the occasion is bigger. bigger and not much bigger than when Buddy died, and not bigger when Carrot gone, and things like this. No, so you find the man, singer, no, so you find people singer. would be on the best, so that, it will arise from the different, and I, there's not because even when we did carroting, cat hog. In fact, we went circles, had a thing, and we were in circles, Both. and we played by circles, and and that was January. We did it, and it was phenomenal. Everybody loved it because we had to play. So, so cat came on and do a thing. It's on YouTube. That. I saw that. It's on YouTube. Like, I, I, both I, inner circle and I, third world. Yeah, 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 yeah because we all that, came yeah. out of except for Richie. Yeah. All the rest of my them was out of. <coughs> circles yeah, yeah. so it was good so to me I have no problem on the, on the record I I wish you sir all the best in life mm -hmm. you have a lot of history mm -hmm. you have a lot to give to people because of knowing the artists both knowing them jokes and the good and bad side yeah. of everything the good, the bad, and, the and, and the ugly mm -hmm. and the things the good thing about it is that people need to know history mm -hmm. and my suggestion to you is that after this that you do a book I'm doing and book. and the book will go through and um, because we can tend to get stories told by foreigners, mm. but we need the people who that really was, was in it. We mm. need that more. We need to be our own creators. We need to be our own and, and our own critics and things like that. And it's very very important. So history is very important. Well, Mr. Carl Grant is helping me with my book. Well, that's it. Can't be that because he knows it inside yeah. out. Mm, you know. So so I wish you. God's blessing. Mm -hmm. I wish you health and strength, sir. And, yeah, and, and youth is a much of a number. And people respond to that. He doesn't fly off the handle. He, he's a very patient man. And all of that goes into creating the atmosphere where you can do your creative best. Speaking of the creative bests, here is a figure who is almost lost to memory these days, sadly, Johnny Nash who probably did more in the early days to turn the world onto reggae than, than anybody. Except he wasn't telling you it was reggae. He was having big pop hits in the United States, one of the biggest of which was I Can See Clearly Now, which has been covered by Jimmy Cliff and all kinds of people. And George was the engineer on I Can See Clearly Now. And those early hits of his were really rock steady, you know. I, I mean, the, the picking guitar, I had the great joy of seeing Johnny and Nash live twice. And I really have never talked to other people who have seen Johnny Nash because he retired so early. Uh, I think he became a preacher by the mid-70s and stepped away from music. I saw him perform one time with a three-piece band on the back of a flatbed truck at the Del Amo Mall 
Just a picking guitar, a bass, and a drum, and Johnny Nash. And I watched him for over an hour uh, do a TV taping where something went wrong with the equipment, and he just started vamping and walking from one end of the stage to the other, singing a cappella, doing songs with the band that they weren't there to do, entertaining while they fixed the problem, you know. I mean, a great, great entertainer. But again, to, to take that and get that onto a recording that communicates to people you know, I'm just thinking of those early songs like Hold Me Tight, you know, but I can see clearly now this is a song that I think even the great Jamaican artists were taken aback when they heard this record, you know. Yeah, and it's got a Bob Marley song on it, Kama Kama. Uh, I think altogether he recorded uh, almost two dozen Bob Marley songs. And, because and some Peter Tosh as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because he had hired them as writers for his JAD record label back in 1968. Yeah, great singer, and, and a lot of people these days would not know that he started out on the Arthur Godfrey show yeah. uh, as a very young man doing a completely different kind of music here in the U.S. before, in the later years, he started going to Jamaica to record. <laughs> Yeah, I'm getting sick, you know. 
and uh, was working the project with uh, Fatty Gross in uh, <coughs> Georgie's. Uh, we, we, we met and then just you know, yeah, you know, we clicked and uh, and uh, we working on uh, the CDI. I did with, uh, with Patrick and uh, Georgie's gonna. Mix it for us. And, uh, hopefully, we we'll get it out soon. Uh, live it in the fast lane. When I was at Woodstock, you know, mm -hmm. the Oh yes, of course. I saw this guy, of course, playing Congo with Richie Hay. With Richie Hay. So I see. I was watching him, but he wasn't watching me. <laughs> I, was, I was looking, but I couldn't spot <laughs> him. Um, I've been. Um, you know, we've you know, been involved with reggae music for a long time, but music in general. And uh, one of my favorite artists was um, Ernest Smith from back in the days, for several reasons. One, I used to love his music, but he also went to the same high school as I went to, and discovered that this man was the, the guy that mixed the, the popular uh, Life Insurance for Living album. He was the sound engineer on that album, and his sister, his, his, his sister is a, a part of the group, SPM, SPM, SPM yeah. was the part. And I remember, not even less than a year ago, I was listening to that album and thinking, man, the, the, the harmonies in the background is amazing. I think, the, how come this song is not, you know, you know it's, it's not one of the things that you hear in radio, even after all these years. And you start out, it's just got a mix in it. I was really impressed with that. Well, so, let me look a bit about that. It really started, you know, the SPM was a young lady back home. Okay. And Byron he had them at his studio. So, so when I did Johnny Nash hold me tight, mm -hmm. I tell Byron that I come steal them from his studio. But the wrong thing. Uh, and the rest is history. I wanted the songs on the spent, Ken does I use the SPM, Sidney Philip and Mary Ann in the end that's my sister. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I developed certain techniques. In studio, drum song, bass song. Right. And we had a we had a from a to an anchor. Yeah. So we had this thing called the doctor. So I could put in three voices and make it sound like six, twelve. And where was this? Where was it? what studio was this? Uh, federal. Yeah. This was at federal. But right. when I joined it, it was West Indies Records. Right, right. And then it split and this split. split. And I stayed with Federal oh. because the owner is my third cousin. Ah, okay. Right, right. Family comes. Right, right, right. For sure. But I kick them off when I want to kick them off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so, what was it like working with uh, Lee Scratch Perry? Uh, you had some experience. Yeah, in yeah. well, I started um, the first songs with Bob. I was just a float, as I said, you know. Right. And going in and look as I became a sponge. Mm. And um, Bob, and, you know, the real right. Yeah. Art, acapella thing, mm. right? And then um, Lloyd Chan was at a band called the Hippie Boys. The Hippie Boys. And they were yeah. the first bands and small enough to talk with Bangkok. Mm. Right. So, okay, so we were going along and one afternoon I go inside here and Lee Perry, the upset, I was in a little thing. So I said, Jabba, do you want to come touch the board? Right? <laughs> in those days, it was the seven in school. Uh -huh. right? And um, they never used to put leader to Everything's for sure. Well, come in, you know, in baggy pants and in white shirt and in white, you know. Well, so I said, I will do everything for me, you know, for me. Get everything done. Mm -hmm. Then come in, so they cut him over at the back. So they have to come through the control room. You know, and heal up everybody, you know, big flat baggy pants and thing. Go up beside me and go. Then say, Mr. Corey, I come to you, sir. I need so much things cut. Put down the tape. Run it through the system and with the clicks and the pops and the shh. So Paul said to him, Paul Cooley said to him one time, he said, yes, I can't cut this, you know. He said, too much service now, I can't go like this. And he said, no, 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 Mr. Cooley. That's part of the flavor, sir. That's part of the, it's like a seasoning, you know. Right, right, right. <laughs> you gotta keep that you know, in the You know what I'm holding this? Computer. You hear the shh. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's why I didn't see his name. I yeah, no, that, was, that was analog. <laughs> we couldn't do nothing about no, that. No, no, no. But I mean, it's, it's the same thing like when you hear um, a coach guitarist play. Yeah. And you hear him sliding. The squeaking. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. in, in some that of the most famous of recordings, like yeah. the, Beatles, the Beatles' Blackbird, yeah. you can, he you can uses the squeaking to create the sound of birds. Right. Bird. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. yeah, you can use that way too. But, yeah. But leading into notes. Yeah, do you hear the slides? I mean, that's, 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 I just, I just, that, yeah, well, yeah, that, it does, and, it, and it. it's also based upon, I think, the engineer's, yeah. uh, place, mic placement. Right, oh, mic, sure. Yeah. That there's creates a, that. Yeah. There's a weird, there's yeah. a weird, there's a weird, there's a weird, that's your genius. That's a, there's a way to get, there's two ways to get out of it. Talcum powder, yeah. right. put the talcum powder on your hand, right. and you can pencil, and now I'm on pencil, Mike, and you wrap it up, and you shake, paper towel. Uh, and you push it down and you keep it like, inside the guitar. And you just put your mic in front of the guitar. And you go in and you have to get wood. Yeah, so you get a mic. Right. And, and you put the guitar in the back, right. in the pre position, like it comes from the mountain top. Mm. You know, Chicago, mm. the mirror too. Yeah. You can see me now. Mm. Mm. The engineer you know, is a brilliant engineer. You hear the horns? The studio was on a mountain. And the mic, the horns, and a mountain. This is true. With nine months. And that's the air. Mm-hmm. Natural with the weed and baby. I learned a lot from these engineers. You know? mm-hmm. uh, I was on a tour with uh, Isaac and uh, Dion, and they did that song. <laughs> that did. Yeah, that's a beautiful song. Jump down and show them. How did you come up with the name of Lala Bella? Where did that name come from? Well, Lala Bella is a city in Ethiopia. So uh, the, the whole concept was, was uh, I guess, when the Islamists had taken over uh, Jerusalem, the emperor in Ethiopia was Emperor Lala Bella. He was actually from a different dynasty from Selassie. But uh, either way, he built the city Lala Bella to uh, mirror uh, Jerusalem, which was under Islamic occupation, so he was, mm. created like the same amount of churches, and they had a river that was the same. And it was like some kind of it was cool. It was a nice spiritual, place. spiritual yeah. thing, and they have the antique churches there, the Bla Bla Bla, that That's like the that got carved, cross in, in the cross, and it's down, carved, and, and carved in the yeah, earth. Yeah. 1980, a band comes up to California from Jamaica called the Rastafarians. They feature Haile Maskell on lead vocals. He was the bass player on most of the Black Woman album by Judy Mowat and a lot of other big hits in Jamaica. And uh, they first started uh, working together in a, a church in Santa Cruz, California, which they turned into a Nyabingi temple, and they would have groundations every weekend, and anybody in town who wanted to come was welcomed. And uh, this is kind of the soundtrack to one of their groundations, this album, and it was engineered by George Raymond. And George did so much great work here in L.A. in the early 80s. Uh, uh, I have a single by the group Exodus called L.A. Gone Reggae, really one of the earliest uh, L.A. reggae releases, worked with so many good groups here in L.A., both on records and doing live sound. Uh, uh, um, Kingston 12, uh, Consolidated Realty Plaza is a place where I saw some some of the earliest really great shows, Carl Dawkins, Ken Booth, and George was doing the sound on those shows, too. He made a big influence on the early days in the 80s of reggae in California, where it became a vital force, especially, I think, between 84 and 86. Those three years were just so packed with Jamaican artists coming up virtually every week, one, two, sometimes three in a single week, and it exploded in, in uh, L.A. It, it became a major musical force and uh, the Reggae Beat Show, which both you and I co-hosted each for seven and a half years with our late partner Hank Holmes, uh, played a great role in, in spreading that, that vibration. Absolutely. When you and Hank started that show, there really wasn't a reggae scene in L.A. and, and that show opened the doors for so many people. I, you know, uh, 
we had people come to LA, move to LA, live in LA. We, we were very fortunate to have a lot of great artists base themselves here and so many great artists and groups come through and do shows. You know, you would see Pablo Moses at the Golden Bear and, and, and the Gladiators, uh, you know, uh, venues would pop up. Uh, Kingston uh, 12 Club. Kingston 12, uh, again, where George did the sound for years, you know, but I can remember somebody calling me up and saying, D did you hear Horace Andy is going to be Kingston 12 tonight, last minute thing, you know, and the first time I ever got to see Horace Andy live, I mean, so many great Mighty Diamonds in intimate settings like that. I mean, you would see the Mighty Diamonds at the Santa Monica Civic and then Club drive Andre. down to San Diego the next, you know, yeah. the next night to see him again in a, in a little club, you know. Yeah. Uh, Fantastic, a fantastic time for reggae in L.A. for sure. And I think one of his proudest accomplishments has been working consistently with the great Peter Tosh, right from Peter's first Legalize It album through the follow-up, maybe Peter's most important album ever, Equal Rights, into the 80s with Mama Africa and Peter's final album, no nuclear war. And he had a, a chart hit in America, although it didn't climb all that far, of Chuck Berry's Johnny Be Good. And uh, it was suggested that he record this song by Donald Kinsey, his lead guitarist. Uh, and Peter, when he defended making this song, always said, what's wrong with telling people to be good? <laughs> Yeah. He didn't just tell him to be good, he said, you better be good. <laughs> yeah, man. But you know, that was one of the first times that reggae ever made it onto MTV, it was the video for that song. So again, making real inroads into America, which had resisted Jamaican music, maybe because they didn't own the music or they couldn't exploit it and those labels in America couldn't exploit reggae. It had already been exploited in Jamaica and again in England by the time it got here. But that really is the period of time a, a, a decade later than Jamaican music was well known in England that the doors finally came down and we really had the opportunity to get reggae in America full strength. And we had teachers like George Raymond, who helped make it a reality, who had such influence on so many of our local reggae groups back in the 80s. True, and, and being such a part of the music with artists like Joe Higgs in Jamaica from the beginning, uh, and so, so bringing a real validity to the L.A. reggae scene for us at that time. Yeah, we got to hear how it should sound, and for that, George Raymond, we salute you. Because the reggae circuit is kind of dried up now. It's not as how it used to be back in the day, like a moving train, Toots and the... It was like a train, Peter and then Bob behind and Toots burning spear. Mine, it was like a ring of fire coming through, you know? It's not like that anymore, so you cannot put all your eggs in one basket, that's why Gospel is very big now. Latin music is very big now. You cannot be picky and choosy. You know what I mean? I'm not a reggae engineer. I'm an engineer peer who was fortunate to be grown up in Jamaica and understand the history of the music. So I regard myself as an engineer peer. Mm. It's just the other day I was thinking I was 20. We are 51 years old, I'm 71, time goes, so each day we wake up we should give thanks, you know.